exactly like Vegas weather, but the completely opposite. <laughs> it's <laughs> raining and cold. And uh, we've got weigh-ins tomorrow. Where's your weight at yeah. right now? Uh, like 10 over. So you're good? Yeah, yeah. Just had a, had a little recovery workout, a little bike ride, and then sat in a sauna for about 20 minutes. So it was really easy this morning. Do some training tonight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Frank Trigg is uh, known for his elbows, and my forearms are feeling them from uh, working with him yesterday. And uh, He's such a pansy. <laughs> he had a chest shield on, like one of those big chest shield things, and I was elbowing the chest shield. And then he said it, my elbows hurt him through the chest shield, so he tried to block with his forearms around his around his body too, and I started banging his elbow, his forearms. Now he's complaining today that his forearms hurt. Well, don't block with your damn forearms, you idiot. That's the chest shield is for. I was told I was just supposed to be here for interviews. That's all I came over for. That's yeah. how we get him to come over. <laughs> <laughs> we lie to him. <laughs> that way he comes over all the time. The food is bad when we're sitting down at a restaurant yesterday and, and Sam Spire, the manager, and Tim Lane, stand-up coach, um, both of them are sitting looking at the fish and won't touch it. And, uh, yeah, well, I mean... <laughs> more food get, for me! <laughs> you gotta, you gotta yeah. remember, Americans aren't used to sea bass coming out with the skin still on it. And it was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a whole fish, minus the head and the tail. They cut the fillet in half, they cut the belly in half, pull all the guts out, pull all the bones out, whatever cooked it and then put it back together like a sandwich almost, but the skin was on either side of it and both Sam and Tim looked at it I was like, yeah, I'm not <laughs> doing it. So Tim and Marcus switched food. Tim, uh, Marcus got some pork. He didn't like pork, but he ordered pork. And it ended up working out because he ended up eating Tim's fish and Sam just had dessert. <laughs> it was funny. Yeah, he chopped it. That's what he didn't eat. Yeah, he was like, I'm just not going to eat this. And they, they had no reason to send it back to the kitchen, so he couldn't go like, hey, look, I'm going to get some new crap. I'm going to get some new stuff. You don't really do that in England. The way in America, in America you'd be like, take it back, we want something else. Yeah. You I found out in Japan too, like I ordered a glass of wine, it was horrible, and I went to send it back and the guy like didn't know what to do. That was like, uh, uh, uh. So I just ordered another one, when the bill came, he tried to charge me for both glasses of wine. I'm like, look, the other glass of wine is still sitting there, I didn't, I didn't drink it, I don't like it, take it off the bill. And that was another full 45 minute argument trying to explain to them not, I'm not paying for it. It's, uh, it's not it's not common, which it should do. You're in a restaurant, you're, you're paying for the food. Yeah. You should get what you want. I actually like that about American culture, but um, in England, you don't do that because they will spit in your food when they bring it out the second time. It you almost tastes like they spit in the food the first time. <laughs> That's true. You know, lose the situation. Dude, like, like I, had a, I had quail with English peas. I'm yeah. like, okay, English peas is peas. No, it's peas cooked in milk with, with fat pieces of bacon thrown in there. Like, what in the hell is that? Like, why would that be called English peas? Because no one else but people from England can eat it. You wonder why they fight so much. They're angry. Yeah, they're very, very, very angry. angry. Yeah, it's mad culture. It's very mad. Do you know why Bama is now in Birmingham this time around rather than London? Like what? Um, no, they're kind of, they're getting smart because they're expanding. They're trying to expand their clientele. They do they get through to different cities. You can't stay in one spot. You can't just be in London and expect the whole country to watch you just because you're in London all the time. So you have to kind of go out and see your fans. And one of that is coming to, is coming to Birmingham. I'm the, now one to, they have one December 10th is their next event. Um, and it's someplace else too. It's not London, it's not here. It's another- Manchester probably. No, it's not Manchester either. Really? It's another place I haven't, I've heard of it, but I don't, I don't recall off the top of my head, but it's not a place that's like a normal spot that I would even think about going. You know, Manchester I know because of Manchester United, obviously. Um, then London, because it's London. And then Birmingham I've realized because it's not Alabama. Because that's what I was thinking. I'm like, oh, look, they're coming to America and being in Alabama. This is great. Like, oh, what, England? Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Now I know where Birmingham, Alabama got its name from. <laughs> exactly. I was say, not the other way around. Right. <laughs> yeah, it should have been called New, New, New Birmingham, Birmingham, right? Yeah, yeah. Like New York. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they got Old York here. And, uh, well, yeah, well, actually, Old York is New York too, because it got sacked twice. What did it really? Come on, don't you know your history, English history? Oh, here, York, we go, here we go, here we go, history lesson again. York got, York got sacked by, uh, by William Wallace when he was, was trying to free the Scots, and then it got destroyed again in World War II. It got completely raised, just flattened. So it's actually, York is actually New York. Not and, just then, and then New York is New New York. Well, actually, it's, it's actually New York, and Europe now should be New New York. Not just a fighter, also an historian. <laughs> I got too much time my, on my hands in hotel rooms. I spent a lot of time watching National Geographic. <laughs> So, uh, we spoke about it in the first episode, changing opponent, change from five rounds to three rounds, mm -hmm. um, changing the size of the opponent and the style of the opponent a lot. Uh, judo, gym, wallhead. Um, change in strategy for the fight? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they completely change it. I mean, you're talking about, you're talking about a stand-up kickboxer, you know, and he's 
t a lot taller, a lot lengthier, uh, one punch, one kick kind of kind of style. Um, wall hits, all of that, but not, but opposite. Like he, he doesn't do any of that. So it's we have to come up with a whole new game plan. I had to, unfortunately, I had to. I had some guys that you know you have to pay your training partners. So I had some training partners that would come in and they're being beat up, and I had to let those guys go because now you have a whole different opponent. And I had to get shorter guys and and guys a little bit better at grappling. And guys wait, 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 is that why I'm here? No, and then you're here just to be my comic relief. <laughs> when you found out that Tom uh, Kong Watson was injured, did it upset you? Uh, you were expecting a title fight. No, I fight. thought it was weird because I signed the fight. Then he signed after I signed the fight, and he immediately comes out without. You know, I don't know why Trig wanted to sign to fight me when he, he saw that I was hurt. But I already signed. One, two. I didn't, had no idea he was hurt. Like I don't. I don't. It may. You guys may think I'm on because I do a lot of stuff on Twitter and Facebook and my my website. Like I'm always working. That I'm out there reading all the stuff that is said towards me or you know stuff about me or or whatever. And I don't look at any of it. I had no idea Tom was injured. I had no clue. My thing is like, if you knew you were hurt, you know, or had an injury, why don't you tell Bama, hey, hold on a second. And you go check out by a doctor, I have an injury, and I go check out by the, by the doctor. Let me see what he says, or, or my doctors and my trainers, and kind of get away together and figure out what they say. Then turn around and come back out and go, okay, look, I'm, I'll be ready to fight by then. Or no, I can't fight, my injury's too bad, I'm not going to be able to recover in time. Like, do something like that as opposed to going, you know, coming out there, oh, you know, why does he want to fight me now that I'm hurt? But that's just the only way he's gonna be able. He's gonna have a shin. I might, I might get a one week or two week training camp, and and I didn't find any of that stuff. Out. Like, any of that stuff, I didn't find out until after the time got pulled, and they were switching opponents on me. Because I don't sit around and read crap. Like, I just don't. You know, I read stuff that's interesting to me, and that obviously wasn't interesting to me. So. Such as the history of of you. Yeah, I spent a lot too much time. With you. So uh, actually, after your win uh, in, in London at the Wembley Arena last time around when he fought Ninja Hua mm -hmm. uh, after that fight actually to tell the truth before you had even said anything about fighting the, for the title and Bama stopped hyping it right after his win they said Frank wants a title shot and, and I don't think you're aware of this because you were back in the change room I was out watching the fight oh yeah I had no idea no <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and they were basically just hyping the fight and uh, uh, saying Frank uh, Trey wants a title shot and and Tom said I don't think Frank should fight at 185 I think Frank should go back down to 170 uh, any comments to that? No I mean it's not I mean I can say anything I've, I've said guys should retire I said Anderson Silva should have retired like six years ago <laughs> you know and now he's on a 14 no streak and the most powerful bomb best fighter in the world and just dominating fools like uncontrollably like I'm watching this guy fight and I'm, I'm not even watching him fight anymore I'm watching his sometimes you know every time you like like watch a Guy Ritchie movie you're looking for the new weird thing he puts in the movie to, to mess with your head. Yes. And it's got the same characters, it's all the same characters, and they're doing different parts in every movie, but then all of a sudden he throws something weird at you, you're like, whoa, what the hell is that all about? That's kind of what Anderson Silva does for me every time I watch him fight. He throws something brand new and weird out there. That no one's seen before. Yeah, and so I'm like, what the hell is that? And how'd that come out? And like, uh, you know, it's, it's for me, it's fun to watch him fight. So, I mean, fighters can say anything about any other fight they want. It's up to the fighter to make his own decision, you know, however they may do it. And, you know, you might get in a situation where you're kind of forced out. You know, where, where like, um, a Chuck Liddell, like, I know he wants to continue to fight. Like, I know he wants to fight. He's got, and to me personally, I think he's still got the skills to fight. I think he ran into some guys that um, just have his style kind of turned down, but he's got, he still is very viable. But Dana White kind of pitched him, here, you're going to push him to front office when you're just not going to fight anymore, period. And just said you're not going to do it anymore. So he kind of got forced out a little bit, but I, I know he still has the fight passion. He still, still wants to do it. Uh, Randy? Is done. He does, he does not want to fight anymore. Like he's he's walked away with his own terms. He's done. Like he doesn't want to fight anymore. But you know, guys said long time ago about both guys should have retired long before they did, and they still were beating guys' asses. And so they lost some. They won some. They weren't in the prize, but they still were better than you know eighty percent, eighty five percent of the other fighters out there. They were killing everybody. You know, top ten percent they weren't beating up, but they were beating up everybody else. And that's pretty viable. You know, yeah. especially the careers that those two have had. So a fighter can say anything he wants about another fighter. It makes no difference. Uh, it's what that fighter wants to do, and, and I, I am, in my mind, you know, I have to struggle to keep under 200 pounds. Like I'm on a pretty strict diet, I work out pretty hard, um, I eat pretty clean. Um, uh, Gray Man's fiance, Jess, has been helping me a little bit with, with my diet planning and, and, and giving me some new ideas too. And like after this fight, I'm a, I'll, be, uh, I'll be a vegetarian for 30 days after this fight. Uh, Why? I've got some health issues i got to kind of deal with, just because, um, and... It seems when I'm a vegetarian, it seems that they work themselves out a little bit easier. So some of them are, are is, is traditional pain of, 
of training arthritis and, and, and knee injuries and shoulder injuries and stuff like that that kind of hurt and not 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 injuries per se like more nagging stuff that's kind of always around and I've got some other stuff too that I'm trying to deal with so I, I um, I'm always trying to find a better way and vegetarianism seems to be the, the way to, to kind of do it but then Mac Danzig is one of my close friends that fool's always sick and he's a straight he's a straight vegan and that kind of stuff kind of throws me off so you know he's actually been uh, healthy uh, he's you know he's fighting on October 1st and he's uh, uh, going to going through camp right now yeah. and uh, if you ask my head and my face <laughs> he's doing pretty he's good doing all right. he's doing alright <laughs> He's yeah. the one of the hardest team 155 is I know. Yeah, yeah, dude, he crushes. He's got he's got a lot of strength behind him. It's kind of weird, especially for a guy that doesn't even kind of red meat. And, none, you know. none at all. And uh, he's uh, this time around is is you know he had a, he was supposed to have four um, had his uh, a fight uh, back in I think it was late August and then he had that injury. Where, yeah, yeah, his rib injury. Yeah, <laughs> where the actually ligament came clean off his rib. Oh, is that what happened? Okay, yeah. I decided like boost some courage out or whatever. No, yeah, so really that's what you thought. For, yeah. Mac is tough. And yeah. you know, Mac, when Mac's sitting on the exercise bike, not able to train, that means Mac is hurt. And, yeah. and, and he's sitting there and he goes, oh, I just think it's like a crack rib, I should be right. No, he went to the doctor and, and the ligament, they, it comes straight off, clean off the rib cage. Yeah. And, uh, but now he's, he's healed up and he's been healthy the whole camp and I'm looking forward to seeing him on, in, the UFC on, on October 1st. Yeah, that'd be a good fight. Anyway, so I, I try to keep my weight down anyway. Like I'm trying to stay as small as possible. And I can't, I have a hard time staying under 200 pounds. It's just the way, just the way I'm built, just the way my metabolism works now, I'm just under 200. So for me to cut from being on a pretty strict diet and, and hovering around 195, and then trying to cut down to 170, and being able to recover, I can make 155 pounds. You pay, you pay me enough money, I can make 155. <laughs> I can't function next day and be able to fight. You, a, a guy will touch me one time in the chest, I'll have a heart attack and fall over. So what's the point? You know, at 170, I can make weight, and that was my biggest mistake when I'm back to the UFC, is trying to fight at 170. I'm not viable at 170, I'm viable at 185. Like, I have, I have a strong stance at 185, and when we won't be too long before I'm back in the top 10, even at, even at 39 years old, which is kind of way past everyone else's prime, but I'm actually getting better, because I made the choice to go up to 185, get smarter with my diet, you know, even, you know and it's, it's my age, it's the 1 or 2% change. You know, it's not the big change. Anyway, with all that, Tom telling me to go back to 170, it's just because he doesn't want to fight me. It, it, when it, it becomes a problematic when everyone's when everyone's six foot two, and everyone's standing, you can look great eye to eye. And obviously, you have to fight a guy that's five nine. That really throws off your game. It's a, it's it's really hard to punch down at somebody. It's really hard to try to stop somebody. And obviously, it, and it takes a lot of energy. You know, Kung Lee doesn't make it look like it takes a lot of energy, but it takes a lot of energy to throw a lot of knees and a lot of kicks. And so, if you got somebody that you've got to kick all the damn time, it's going to wear your ass out. That's just how it works. And guys don't really want to fight a shorter kind of pluggy or kind of strong guy that's going to get inside him all the time it makes it difficult because it's not what the weight class is about. The weight class is about, you know, we saw a Silver and O'Connor fight. I think it was 14 feet of guy out there at one point. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, those guys are tall. It's like, you know, so you throw a guy in there like me, like, you know, ho-hum, just, you know, that was my best attribute against Jason Miller, that he couldn't do anything to me because when I was inside, my inside game is so far inside compared to his inside game that he has nowhere to go. Like, I'm, I've got by all of his defenses and I was kind of stuck. So on the topic of, of weight, you said 185 makes more sense. Uh, as you know, uh, Matt Hughes opponent, Diego Sanchez dropped out the other day. If you get the call from Dana White, oh. can you make 170? Here, here's the deal. You get a phone call from anybody at the UFC. I, I don't care if it's the front desk security guard calls you. You fucking call back. <laughs> and you ask them what they need from you. And you give them everything plus 10% more. And you hope that one day they ask you to come back and fight again. They hope one day they come, in my case, come in and commentate one of their little offset internet small ass shows and leg and plead to get in there. You know, anybody that's ever fought in the Super Bowl, fought, anybody played, played in the Super Bowl, or anybody that's played in, in the World Series of Baseball, they all want to get back in. If they won Wimbledon, they all want to get back in and do that again. It's like they want to do it one time, they try to do it all the time. They show you back in. And once you play in the big leagues, you always want to get back in. If they called me and said, look, Matt Hughes is, uh, Diego Sanchez is hurt. We want to finish this trilogy off. We know that you're 0-2 against Matt, but do you think you can fight him in three weeks? My only thing I would have to do is go, it's got to be the catch weight. I can't make 170. There's no way for me to get, I can't get down there. You can't make 170. Not in three weeks. There's no fucking oh, way. Right, right, right. But if he goes, look, it's six months from now when I have the trilogy, you know, I could definitely get, I could definitely get my weight down there and, and be functional, you know, and, and for that one fight, I could probably pull it off. You had, as you, as you know from, from UFC's press conference yesterday, mm -hmm. Nick Diaz didn't show up. Yeah. GSP 
No way. I couldn't make the weight. I couldn't really make the weight and be functional for that, for that fight. That fight's in six weeks, right? No. Yeah? yeah so you had twice the amount of time. Yeah, there's no way. I couldn't do it. How I, I wait, I wait to a, like, totally, like six months. Six months? Yeah. yeah. I didn't get, I mean, to be viable for a fight like that, yeah, that'd be great. But you know, but they, they brought, they brought uh, Koscheck, got the fight against, uh, against Hughes. They brought in Koscheck, and Koscheck's taking the fight on three weeks' notice, which is smart. And they put Carlos Conner in, you know, because Diaz is a, is a fucked up again. You know, and what a sweet kid Diaz is. I mean, what a nice kid. We have long, we have long, great conversations. We have a, both have an interesting in road bikes. They do triathlon, triathletes, both Diaz brothers do, and I, I ride a lot of road bikes. And so we have a mutual interest in what great kids. Very respectful, very humble. Exactly. Off camera. We were talking about this today earlier on, how nice they are off camera. I, I believe that they are extremely camera shy and their defense mechanism is to be really aggressive and I'm not going to do it and, and you know, I ain't no bitch and, and that, that's their style. And it's great for camera once you get them on the camera, but when they don't show up at press conferences, it hurts them. And, and this is, I really, I really thought that, that this is going to be that, you know, GSP is saying that Carlos kind of a tougher opponent. He's a tougher opponent because he's been in camp with GSP and they have the same training coach. They both have, have uh, Greg Jackson. Um, Greg Jackson. But Diaz is a much tougher opponent. He's a much tougher opponent. He has, he's the only guy that has shape for days. You can hit him as hard as you want. GSP isn't, isn't a hard hitter. He, he can, you can be in there with him for days. He's, he'll have to keep the same pace that GSP is going to keep. You'll be able to hit him. He'll hit you back twice as many times. And both guys are going to be hitting very hard. But, but Diaz is going to win the stand-up battle because he hits so often and just keeps moving. And then when you go on the ground with him, whether you're on top of him or underneath him, Diaz is a nightmare. This is the first time we're actually going to see GSP get a real, real legit guy that on paper is a little bit better than him in every aspect of his own game. You know, and that was going to be very interesting for me. Now the question becomes hard and mental ability and experience, and GSP obviously has the experience in it, which makes it an even factor, but it's going to be it was a very interesting fight for me. You know, the Conor fight, I love Carlos Conor. I think he's a great competitor. You know, I, I thought he was going to be a champ a long time ago. He's always got that kind of bill, but against GSP, I just don't, I just don't think it's going, to, it's going to pan out as well, but Carlos has also got that surprising, ha ha, I hit you with one punch and you fell down, ha ha, kind of power. So it's, it's very, he's very, um, don't, don't let his, his young face and his kind of, Ho-hum kind of attitude that fool you. It's still going to be a good fight, but not a great fight like that, like we're going to have with Diaz. I agree. Um, so back to to your fight and and Jim Warhead. Uh, obviously, the the style of fights is is completely different. Um, pros and cons to every fight, to every style. What's your main concern about Judo Jim Warhead? He's got amazing ground pound, um, and he's not scared to shoot. He'll shoot it. it, it, it he shoots pretty proper, not not extremely correct, but, but pretty close, and he shoots at weird times. So it's like the timing is, is off with him because he shoots at weird weird intervals. Like most guys, wait for a punch or wait for a kick to land, you know, or get caught and blocked and then shoot afterwards. Like he'll he'll shoot in the middle of a kick. He'll shoot in the middle of a knee. He'll he'll shoot right in the middle of a of an 18 punch combination. He'll shoot in the middle of a third punch coming at him. He just he'll take 15 hits as he's punching. So it makes it very it makes it very strange to try to stop his takedown. And if he gets on top of you, man, he is vicious with his ground upon. He's and he keeps his hips in tight. He knows how to keep you at bay. He's very, very, very difficult to be uh, underneath of. So I don't, you know, because of that, instead of worrying about, you know, if Watson's on top of you, he's just gonna throw a punch at you. Just slide yourself underneath and sit up and escape or get a quick sweep and you're back on top. With uh, with uh, uh, Wallhead, it is a whole new game. I had to, had to learn three or four new things. I had to really learn three new things in my in this game plan from underneath just to figure out how to get out get out of it in case I got to that position. So. Yeah, it's pretty tough. I saw them yesterday. I was very impressed, and that's through Neil. Yeah, Neil Nelson is. Um, it, it, it was strange because we talked about it. Well, I like Tim Lane because Tim Lane is, a, is another. He's a true left-hander that teaches me how to punch as a true left-hander, not as a right-handed guy, telling me how to how to be a left-hander off of him trying to stop left-handers from fighting these other right-handed guys. You know, this is a real left-handed guy that tells me, "No, this our best weapon is this. It's not that. This is really what the best weapon is. This is really how we approach it. This is really what we should be doing." And he's really kind of changed the game up for me in that aspect. Neil Melson is a six foot four, two hundred and seventy five pound gargantuan, and you're like, dude, this is just stupid. The stuff you're showing me is just not going to work. It's fucking stupid. Like this is no way it's going to work. It was like a learning curve about two or three months before I all of a sudden just one day I was rolling around with some of the guys, and it just worked. Like it just worked. I was like, what the hell? He's like, yeah, you know, my style isn't a big guy style. And you stop me and look and watch him and watch him roll and watch other guys roll, and he does a little guy style on a, with a big frame. 
and it's really movement, and it's not really jiu-jitsu, it's anti-jiu-jitsu. You, know, you know, Josh Bonnell called it cash wrestling, and you know, it's a car Parisian, he's a black belt in car Parisian, and he's a black belt in go-car, so it's that whole thing is, but it, it's a whole game plan of, of neutralizing what your opponent's doing, of balancing them at all times, whether on the top or the bottom, the side or standing up, you're always trying to unbalance them, and then the moment you get a hold of something, you try to rip it off and beat to death with it, whatever it is. You don't care if you only get a hold of a thumb, you take his thumb off. You know, you only get a hold of a toe, you take the whole toe off. You know, you, you get a hold of wow. you get a hold of a chin, you try to destroy the whole chin. Like you're just trying to get a hold of a piece of them, and then you rip the whole thing off. And guys tend to tend to give up. When you get a hold of a little something, they tend to give up because you kind of snake your way into getting the whole piece that you wanted. You know, I've just got the hand, but somehow I snake my way into getting the armbar. The armbar doesn't have to be perfect for me to get the armbar. It can be ugly. And sometimes you know, sometimes winning is ugly. Sometimes winning is not. You don't you don't get a, a Verdum triangle lock or a Verdum armbar, and all this. Oh, look how pretty that was. Look how amazing. Sometimes you get like a piece of it. You know, when you get a Frank Mir, Tim Sylvia's forearm break, you know, that wasn't a very pretty arm bar to begin with, and all of a sudden it broke. You know, it's that kind of thing. That's Neil's whole kind of style is, you know, get it, rip it off, and that's how you're going to win. Like a late catch at the nightclub, in a way. Yeah, yeah, kind of, you know, you know, <laughs> hey, going home, going home with a whale is a lot better than going home alone. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, that's the change that you uh, feel is, is the biggest pro for Jim Warhead. Now, What's your biggest kind of relief going, that's not a concern anymore, which it would have been with oh, Tom uh, Oh, his, his stand-up, he doesn't kick as much, he doesn't kick nearly as much, doesn't knee nearly as much. So when, you know, when you're a big shooter, you know, knees and kicks are a concern. You don't want to be in the middle of thinking that he's going to start throwing punches and you take off and all of a sudden the knee's coming at your face. Mm -hmm. And that, that can, you can, because remember that impact, it's not just him lifting that knee up, it's you running into that knee as being lifted up. The impact is incredible. And, yeah, a lot of times you run through it and you're able to take a guy down, but man, it, it does it slows you down a little bit and it hurts. So yeah, that's a big relief. That and, and I like guys that shoot too because it makes it easier for me because I've got great defense. Oh, yeah. oh thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was uh, something else from uh, Mr. Mastek behind the camera that you're writing on a piece of paper over there. No, nothing. Uh, tomorrow is the weigh-in. Uh, I, I I would like to make something very clear. Mm -hmm. Last time we were in Toronto, you hit me in the back of the head afterwards. J. Heron thought that was really funny and he thought we started tradition and he hit me in the head. People <laughs> commented going, why are they hitting you in the head? <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's something that Frank Trittich, it's the reason why there's a distance between us right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we're done. Catch. <laughs> Pussy. <laughs> I have one last question for you here. Um, on my shirt, I'm repping. Some I know the flag might give it away a little bit, but do you know who this is? You mean the name right next to it? Last oh, question. Oh fuck! <laughs> <laughs> There's a name right on there. I mean, you can't. The Mauler. You can't. <laughs> really? You can't. Can't read that. Really? Fuck. I fucked up. Do you know who he is? Isn't he the the Swedish boxer that he won, but he couldn't fight in his own country because it was still banned at the time? Is that right? He won. He won that. He won the the title at his weight class, whereas he had to do it outside the country. Because it was boxing was banned, it was banned in, the, in Sweden. That was Armand Crunch. Armand ah. Crunch is a boxer, and Paolo Roberto has done the same thing. Paolo Roberto and Armand Crunch. I'm impressed you knew that though. This guy, however, Mr. Alex Gustafsson, I'm glad, even though you had the name, you didn't know. He said, just for Matt Hamill. Oh, was that who it was? Yes. Oh, yeah. Sweden's, uh, actually, second. David Bjelkin was the first one. Yeah. But Sweden's second UFC fighter. And uh, two or five. And I was gonna say if you. Yeah, he did pretty good. Yeah. You watched the fight? Yeah. You saw it? Yeah, I remember now. Yeah, he looked pretty good. Yeah, he, did, he, did, he uh, did very well. He retired my handle. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> which, he did. Uh, which uh, no matter what anybody says, that's pretty. You, they can give yourself a pat on the back for that one, Mike. When you retire somebody, you beat somebody up. Whether whether kind of streak they're on, no matter what, a fighter's a fighter. Like a guy's gonna fight his entire life. Like Matt Hamels has been a fighter since birth. He will fight till he dies. Whatever he's doing, he's gonna be fighting. And he made him quit the sport. Like you made him stop the sport. That's legit, right? That's legit, man. That's <laughs> legit. Yeah. Uh, and uh, actually, Sweden, we have three fighters now. Next on the Ultimate Fighter, that's about to start next week. You have to watch Hamid Khorasani. Yeah, you Kira know what, Khorasani. You, you know I don't watch that show. <laughs> you know I don't watch that show. <laughs> it's not. It's not my thing. I'm. Mean, I watch it for your guy. But watch him, know. just because he's hilarious. He's crazy. Is he on uh, Miller's Hamid, team? Hamid, you're fucking crazy. Is he on Miller's team? Yeah, uh, the um, two of them together. So it's, so it's he's two, crazy the Miller. So it's two half half mentally retarded children. Yes, making one fully retarded child. <laughs> <laughs> two shirt bus riders. All right. <laughs> That's it. We're done.
Um, you have uh, You've changed. <laughs> oh, that was good. <laughs> Word. That was good work. That was good. That was good. That's the second time you got me. Yesterday at dinner, we're sitting down, we're eating dinner, and he's asking our waitress, uh, is there any clubs in there to do? Because Marcus and Tim are going to go out, and obviously I'm going to stay in because i got to sleep and rest with the fight. But I'm worth, so it's like Marcus and Tim on one side of the table, and Sam and myself on the other side of the table. Sam Spira, our manager from Extreme Control Management. Um, Randy's working so he could make the trip, so Sam came on this one. So we're sitting there, and Marcus goes, yeah, do you know any clubs? And this girl's like, oh, oh, you know, the one over there, and the one over there, and walk over there, whatever. He goes, yeah, do you know any gay clubs for these two for these two guys? Dead straight face, and the girl immediately goes into, well, yeah, there's this one gay club over here on the corner. I'm not really sure where it is, but I'll get the address for you guys. And I had nothing to come back with. I just had to sit there and take it. It was great. <laughs> like, it was just total deadpan. It was perfect. And then me yawning and just threw male jism in my mouth as I was yawning. So, perfect. Marcus is going to I had to get him back. Yesterday he goes... I'm starting to hit in the bag and he goes, for having as good of a stand, for your stand up being as good as it is, how come you don't, you don't have very much power in your punches? That's not what I said. What did you say? I said, for being such a great stand up artist and having such amazing coaching talent to teach other people stand up, you really do hit like a girl. <laughs> That's exactly what I said. <laughs> he was like, yeah, um, yeah, his chest was up puffing out, his ego was swelling up and all of a sudden he went, wah, 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 I fell over. <laughs> so, uh, it's comeback time for the rest of the weekend. Uh, 